we had, our ba- we had a baptism service last Sunday. Wasn't that awesome to see seven children <laughs> baptized? Well, not just children, but youth <laughs> as well. Well, for you that were baptized, um, we're just praying that God would just make the next stage of your life in Christ rich and that you would grow deep in Him. Anyways, um, so for a couple of weeks, we've taken a, a break from my sermon series and um, we've been going through the book of James and we're going to continue to go through the book of James. And um, today, um, we come to a certain passage and the next passage in the book of James that we come to is a little bit of a heavier one. So let's just pray right now that God would open our hearts to hear what his spirit would teach us through the word. Jesus, we thank you for your word, that your word is truth, that your word is life, that your word always hits right on the mark. God, I just pray that you would bless each heart that is here this morning and that as we open our hearts to your word, God, that you would teach us what it is that you intend. God, that you would give me the strength and the, uh, the touch, Lord, so that I could explain this passage of Scripture to the people in a way that you would be honored and that you would have them understand. And I just, we, we give you honor today, Jesus, because you are worthy. We give you honor, Lord, because you have given us everything that we need for life and godliness. You've given us your word. We thank you for your precious word, Lord. God, and we can't live without it. And we thank you. We, we live by each thing that comes out of your mouth, O oh God. And, and we thank you for revealing your written word to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So as believers in Jesus, there's a great many pitfalls in this world of sin of ours. Now, we all know this. If you've been a Christian long enough, you realize that when you give your heart to Christ, it doesn't mean that it's always going to be a cakewalk, is it? As a matter of fact, we have adversaries in this world that compete with our loyalty to Christ and try to steer us away from from his truth. So in the spiritual world, for example, we have, we have the devil and his demons. Very real. I don't know, you know, sometimes people act as though that there is no devil and there are no evil forces in this world, but as believers, we come to face to face with this sometimes. And, um, you know, the devil doesn't want us to be... Uh, productive, I guess you could say, in our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't want us to be productive in our witness to a world that is lost and is dying and needs uh, the truth uh, spoken in power to cut through the, cut through the veil that, that shields them, the veil of darkness that shields them. He doesn't want that. So you guys, as believers in Jesus Christ, you're the church. The Bible calls us the light of the world a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. The the enemy of our souls does not want that to happen. So he's going to be running interference. And um, in the physical, we also have the systems of this world that are anti-Christ. We see it coming towards the end. We see different signs taking place. And it's apparent that the, uh, the seasons are changing. And there is definitely something happening in the world around us. And um, in part, that fleshly system that's there, you know, is, is, you know, it's definitely the God of this world. The devil is under influence of it. But people also have their own sin nature that they, uh, they yield to as well. So we've got this system with a whole bunch of people that are yielding to the sin nature inside of them. But here's another thing. You have your own fleshly desires as well. And, you know, the Bible teaches us that every one of us in our, uh, in our life, we're sinners. Now, as Christians, we know that Jesus Christ, if you believe in Jesus and you've asked him to be your savior, his, his spirit has come into your heart, but there is always, there's always a tug to return to old ways. There's temptations that we face from our flesh, but the spirit within us 
resists that. So the Bible says that we ought to walk in the Spirit. Walk in step with the Spirit, and you will not gratify the lusts or the desires of the sinful nature. So we've got these three areas. We've got the, and the, you've probably heard this before, we've got uh, the world, the flesh, and the devil. They're all competing with our loyalty to Jesus Christ. And sadly, it's easy for us if we're not careful. The Bible says, watch your life and doctrine closely. Guard your heart above all things. It is the wellspring of life, you know. Be careful because the sin nature is wicked and the heart is desperately wicked and prone to wander from the living God apart from the Spirit's renewing influence and strengthening influence, okay? So in chapter 5, we're going to be continuing my message, uh, my messages in the book of James. Chapter 5, verses 1 to 6 is our, is our text this morning. So if you've got your Bibles and you'd like to turn with me to that, James chapter 5, verses 1 to 6, or you can follow with our overhead as well. Now, my message this morning is the deceit, deceitfulness of wealth. James chapter 5, verses 1 to 6. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth is rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mold your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who is not opposing you. Wow. All of a sudden, James comes out with this. And um, it's a passage that tackles an issue square on without glossing it over. You hear, the resist, you hear the speech in this. It's, it's very direct. This is hardball teaching from God that James presents in this passage. And, and I have made a commitment as your pastor before the Lord to pray about what book he wants us to work through. And when I first started preaching, I was given a very clear conviction to preach the whole counsel of God, the whole biblical text, without steering clear of any difficult passages. It's so easy to gloss over passages that are difficult like this one, because everybody likes to feel good. Now, that's not, we want to be healthy as Christians. We want to be aware out there. The Word of God is, is useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God, the woman of God, may be fully equipped for every good work. God loves us, and he gives passages like this in his word for our benefit so that we can take warning to make sure that we're careful on how we step. Watch your life and doctrine closely. This is a command that is given to us. And, you know, and I'm confident for, for us this morning that God has a purpose in going through the scripture today. And, and it, it amazes me how your weak kind of dovetails toward what's God, what God wants to speak to you on. He prepares the ground of our hearts for things like this. And in J James chapter 4, we see that James addressed the believers about having overconfidence in their own abilities to control the outcomes of their lives. And he, and, and he uses an example of someone who has aspirations to be a successful merchant. So the last passage that, that's leading into this context Always look at the context of every scripture that you're reading to make sure you understand what God is trying to say. There's always a context. So in, in James 4, James is using the example of someone who has aspirations to be a successful merchant, where they, where they make plans to travel to different places, carry on business and make a pile of money here and there. And such a person says that they are going to go here, they're going to go there. And, 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 and they're going to be successful at that without considering the will of God in their pursuits. But James points out that um, 
every person who makes such confident uh, stands on doing this or doing this, that or going here or going there, they are, are just like grass that grows up. And when the sun beats down on it, it withers and fades away. We have no guarantees. Nobody in this world has a guarantee whether they're going to see the light of day in this realm tomorrow. We could go home today after church on our way home. It's our appointment with God. It's appointed unto a man once to die and then to face the judgment. There's not a soul that walks the face of this planet that can confidently say, I'm going to go here tomorrow. I'm going to go there tomorrow. I'm going to do this tomorrow. I'm going to do that tomorrow because the Lord is the one that is in control and is sovereign over all. So, what then should we do? The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We need to be reverent in our heart before God and say, Lord, my life as Christians here, okay, now the world, they're living their life like they've got control. And that's the sin in the garden, right? Everyone wants to be their own God, it seems. But as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we've been set free from that. <laughs> Jesus Christ, the second Adam, has undone what Adam did in the beginning, and that was to be his own God, to do his own thing, his own way, in his own time. I'm going to go here. I'm going to do that. I'm, going to, I'm in charge of my destiny. Man, I think there's a scripture that says this, when someone speaks that way so confidently and arrogantly without considering God, you fool. This hour, your life will be demanded of you. And then who will t- get all the things that you desire for yourself? So this leads into five, chapter 5. Now, James focuses his message down to specifics with the rebuke of those who are most likely to live independently from God. And now there's probably a mixed, a mixed um, congregation, people maybe that were kind of interested in Christianity, kind of checking it out. You know, sometimes people come to church, they don't know the Lord, and they're, they're coming just to check it out. Well, God wants you to know that he loves you. And he has a plan for your life. And he wants to speak to you about these kind of things, right? This is a very uh, tough passage. He focuses on this independent spirit. This independent spirit that says, I am. I am. You see it. I mean, I, I've, said, I've said this to someone else before. I'm not sure if I've ever said it to you guys, but... you. A few years back, there was a beer commercial on, on TV, and it was Canadian beer. Yeah. And you know what their big slogan was? I am. I am. They put it in great big letters on the screen. I am. And then they'd go Canadian. I am. I, this is the lie. I am not. I am not in control. I am not sovereign over my life. I do not have a say in how things are going to end up realistically. You know who does? The Lord. God is going to hold each one of us accountable for our lives. If you don't know the Lord here today, today is the day that you could come to know Him and you could surrender all to Him, all to you, Lord. I surrender all to you. I freely give you. If that's you, if you're listening online this morning and you need to resolve this, God loves you, and he's calling out to you. He's asking you to surrender your will to repent of the wayward way that you've gone and to come back to the shepherd of your soul. He will lead you into paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He'll help you. He will help you to overcome the things that are binding you. He'll deliver you. He'll set you free. I think it's fair to say that um, when James writes this about riches and, and, and about people that have this attitude of sinful attitude of I'm rich and I'm going to get richer, I'm going to build my own kingdom, here, it, it's safe to say that James is not saying that in itself that rich, richness is wrong, that being rich is wrong. 
He's not saying that. But the target is, is, is for the unrighteous rich, maybe those who are religious even, who are playing church but not surrendered totally to the Lord, or to those that figure that they can do their own thing and they can you know, make their own way, like I had explained. They say, you know, some people have come to church over the centuries, and we don't know who everyone is, right? I don't know, really, who's sitting in the, in the congregation today, who's listening online. I don't know your heart like God does. Only God knows your heart. I can't judge that. But there are people here that are in love with their wealth more than they are in love with God. They're not surrendered to the will of Christ. Their God is money. Their God is the things of this world and, and the pleasures of this world. And, and James has some very stern words here. Not only are the people referred to as wallowing in wealth here, as a pig wallows in a sty, but they abuse the power that comes with their wealth through oppression, cruelty, and injustice towards other people. So then, if I know and love God as my Father, then I'm going to have His heart for other people too. If I love my money more than I love God or my fellow man, then it's going to, it's going to cause a tr problem. There's going to be a problem. James gets to the point. The love of money has made the rich people he was addressing so self-centered and self-focused that they were defrauding people that were working for them of their pay that they, they owed them, bringing a hardship on those who were forced to hire themselves out to make a living for their families. In the area around Palestine, um, in the area of ancient Israel during the time of Rome, there was a an increasing concentration of land being assimilated into large estates. Now, we've seen this happen in the Canadian prairies, you know, from the time of the war. You know, mom and pop's farms were gobbled up by large agricultural operations, and partly because the expense of farming was increasing, so you needed more land to produce enough grain and, and provisions to make it actually worth your while. Well, this was happening in Palestine at the same time as, um, as, we're, as the, this book was written. People were trying to scratch out a living, and they were taxed very heavily by the Roman Empire. So they were having a hard time of making it, and they were selling out to large landowners out of trying to survive and trying to put a living together for their family and feed their families. So this passage is a warning for those rich in this world not to trust in wealth because possessing great wealth will not give a person genuine meaning in life. King Solomon very wisely wrote once in Ecclesiastes 5.10. He says, he says this, he says, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. It's meaningless. Why? Because everybody is going to die in this flesh. And your money is worth nothing when you die. It's worth nothing to you. It goes to somebody else. Luke 19, 19 to 26, while Jesus was teaching the people, he told a parable to the crowds is a warning against being consumed with self-indulgence and ignoring the suffering of other people around you. In, in this parable, Jesus says this. He says, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was, a, was laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. At the time, the time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades, where he was in torment. He looked up, and he saw Abraham far away and Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember, 
that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. And now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all of this, between us and you is a great chasm that has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. There's coming a day when people are going to be separated from God and sent to this place. It's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It is His will, but nevertheless, there's hardened hearts that will not bend, that will not yield, and will go to this place where the rich man went. And James' story is very similar to Jesus' parable of Lazarus and the rich man. Sadly, those who are rich in this life but not rich towards God are going to find themselves on a road to hell. And unless they repent and turn away from the futility of their thinking, they are going to be lost and lost eternally. And this should concern us as believers in Christ. This should be something that causes us to go to the Lord in prayer and say, God, take my life and use me as your ambassador to reach the people around me that are lost, that can't see their right hand from their left. Because I know that you gave yourself Jesus so that this world could have a way to know you, to be atoned for their sin, to become at one with you, to be forgiven, to be taken from death into life. After all, friends, sometimes we live as though that we don't need a Savior. We walk in our society as though they don't need saving. Save from what? If, our, if our, our, our thing that we do on, on Sunday mornings is strictly about just for us, we're sadly missing the point. God desires for you and I to be His ambassadors, to share the hope that we've found in Christ, the light of the world. The world is dark. Do we not see the people sinking down? Do we not care if they're drowning all around us and they're going into a lost eternity? God, forgive us. God, forgive us. Help us to have the heart of Christ as He's up on the cross and He's perishing, looking down upon us and going, Lord, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. God the Son, calling out to God the Father to have Mercy. Stephen, the first martyr, as the stones were crashing down on his head, he looked out at the ones who were doing it and said, do not hold this sin against them, Lord. And guess what? God answered that prayer because the apostle Paul was there giving approval to his death. God had mercy. He desires to have mercy. The Son of God did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. That's John 3, 17. We know 3, 16 so much, but 3, 17 is right on the shirt tails of that. You, my friends, are being asked by the Lord to shine your light and to share your hope with the people that God puts in your sphere of influence. And you know what that means? That means we need to live in a way that is fitting of a believer why? Because how are they going to know if they don't see it? And how are they going to know if they don't hear it? If they don't hear the message? It's not just living a good life. You can be part of the Rotary Club and live a good life. But in the end, what's going to happen to a person when they cross over without knowing Christ? Where are they going? They're going to a lost eternity. This ought to break our hearts. And if it doesn't, we need to be shaken out of our mediocrity and brought to our knees where we cry out to God and say, Lord, this church is all about you. It's about you, Jesus. And it's about your mission to save the lost and to make disciples. Disciples are made to what end? So that we can have a nice club and have barbecues on Sunday? Is that what it is? No. That's part of it. Because in the process of serving God and pouring out and being disciples, we find life. 
and we find community, and we find goodness together, and we encourage one another in the walk, because I need encouragement some days. I had a tough week. I had a really tough week. I think in preparation for what I'm preaching today. I had a rough week. All kinds of stuff was coming at me. I'm like, oh, man. Let's put it this way. If serving Christ is all about comfort right now and here, then I'm not a servant of Christ. Because I, I didn't have much comfort this week. Maybe you didn't either. But that's okay, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And guess what? He who suffers is done with sin. So if you're suffering, thank the Lord for the suffering that you're going through. Don't look at it as a curse. Look at it as a blessing, because it drops you to your knees and causes you to look up at God and say, God, have mercy on me. I need you. So when our hearts are that way, when our hearts are humbled before God, then we actually see what he wants us to be and how he wants us to live. Okay, so. On the day of judgment, James is saying that there's going to be a reckoning for those that are rich towards themselves but not towards God. And Paul instructed Timothy to warn people, actually, who have riches to be careful not into, to fall into the trap of loving their money more than they love anything else, more than they love God, more than they love others. Don't keep your life from loving money. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 to 19 says this. Paul is talk, training Timothy. Timothy is a trainee. Paul is preparing him for the ministry that he's, that he's launching out into. So it's applicable to us as we're trainees under the gospel, right? The gospel is our trainer. So we need to pay attention to what Paul's saying. Paul says to Timothy, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. You hear that? God knows what we need, and he actually likes us. He, he likes to pour a blessing out on us from time to time where we really enjoy life. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. You know, even when you're having hard times, you can still have that lightness in the spirit, and it is enjoyable. Isn't it enjoyable when God just places his hand on you, and the spirit falls heavily upon you, and you feel his deep peace in the midst of a storm? Wow, that is awesome. It, that's awesome, isn't it? <laughs> and the world has no idea out there, outside of Christ, what that is. We've got a peace. We sing about it in, in, our, in our worship songs. We got, I got peace like a river. I got peace like a river. I got peace like a river in my soul. Right? I got joy like a fountain. Now, you probably haven't heard that if you're young. <laughs> Maybe you have. And it's one of those songs you sing in youth group to make, make fun of the old people or something. I don't know. We used to sing that when we were kids. But, yeah, it's true. Peace like a river, joy like a fountain in my soul. Why? Because Jesus is Lord. And Jesus has taken my sin. And he's cast my sin as far as east is from the west, never to be remembered again. Because of the grace of God, I am saved through faith. And this is not of myself. It is of the Lord's glory of his grace that I am saved. Thank you, Jesus. What a gift, undeserved, unmerited, totally given to us, free and beautiful. And when we actually catch a glimpse of that and we actually understand that, it is so liberating and freeing. It makes you love God more. And if you love him, you obey what he says. You obey his commands. Many people think that, the, that they would really get to enjoy life to the fullest if they won a lottery ticket or something or, or struck gold, you know, like out there, on the back 40, I'm digging on my property, and all of a sudden, ching, ching, ching. What was that? You know, ooh, a treasure chest. Oh, it's from Barkerville from the 1890s and, or 1860s, and the stagecoach was robbed back then, and they buried it on my property. I'm rich. It's full of gold. Yay. You know, that's what they think is going to bring them purpose and meaning and, and happiness and, and peace in this life. But you know, the truth is, those kind of treasures fade away. People that are 
the richest sometimes are the most miserable. Why? Because it is only in Jesus Christ and in a wholeheartedly serving Him that there is true peace of mind and true joy in this world, for living in this world. The, the, the treasure that Jesus gives us lasts forever. Well, worldly treasures just last for a little while, and they're not going to buy any happiness. So the apostle Pete, Paul also says to Timothy, in Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, 6 to 10, what does he say? He says, but godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. How many people can say that they have contentment with the blessings that God provides? Hey, I admit sometimes when my truck breaks down or, <laughs> you know what I mean? How apt are we sometimes to think, to be grumpy and out of sorts when things just don't go our way? You know, so what if your truck breaks down? That's what they got Napa for. Right? That's why God gave you two hands and, a, and, and Google to Google how to fix your uh, whatever. Is it broken on your truck? It's okay. Thank the Lord in the midst of your troubles and if there are afflictions of broken down stuff or whatever. You know what? That doesn't matter. It doesn't matter in the end. You can't take it with you whether you got a $120,000 truck or a $5,000 truck or a $1,000 truck. It doesn't matter. It doesn't not matter. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it, but we have food and clothing and we'll be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into a temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and have pierced themselves with many grieves. But you, O man of God, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, love, endurance, and gentleness. You know, when you think about that, a baby, a baby's born into the world. Not with any possessions, right? A baby is born into the world without any money, not even a pocket to put their money into if they had money, but they don't. Just certain, just as certain, when you pass over from this life right now into eternity, you're going to go just like a baby with no possessions, nothing except what has been made in the spirit, in your heart, the impact that you had by loving other people, by caring for the, ch the, the church of Christ, by, by loving and, 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 and rescuing the, the folks that are, are downtrodden and beaten. A heart of contentment begins with seeing our material possessions and resources in eternal perspective, right? That, that's where we need to go. Everything we've given, been given, the energy that we have, the health that we have, the, the mind we have to earn a living, the hands we have to fix the broken truck. <laughs> They've been given to us by God as a gift. They belong to Him. Whether I have a $150,000 truck or a $1,000 truck, it doesn't belong to me, it's God's. As a believer, your life is not your own. You are bought with a price. None of it is ours. We're not taking it with us. You know what that means? That means our Heavenly Father has given those things to us to be a stewards of those things. To be a steward of those things. What is a steward? A steward looks after something on someone else's behalf. We are stewards of everything we've been given, including our bodies. <sighs> This is why God calls us in this way not to be pursuing the things of this world and being rich towards this world and poor towards Him. We live in a rich society. Capital pursuits, chief aim of the world. He who has the most toys when they die wins. 
do they? Who ever said that? Someone that doesn't know Jesus. Someone that thinks that all there is is this life right here and that's, that, that's it. But we've been given a revelation that life is eternal. This is only a time where we are given the opportunity to come to know him so that in the end, we are the wheat that he gathers into his barn. Your life, just a tiny pinhead here, eternity stretches on forever in both directions in a vector that goes on forever. Now, I'm not saying that you can't love God if you've got money. I'm not saying that at all. Well, look at all the patriarchs and people in the Bible. There was plenty of people in the Bible that were wealthy. But they didn't worship their wealth. They weren't lovers of that wealth. They gave that wealth to God to use for his glory, and God increased their wealth more. Why? Because they weren't in, in love with it. God's not going to let you have anything that's going to destroy you. You know that? He won't let you have anything that's going to destroy you. The Bible says don't, don't seek to be rich. If you happen to be given wealth in this world, well, God's entrusted you with that, and he's given that to you because he knows that you, you have the capability of letting that be used for his glory out there. And if you haven't been given wealth, well, thank the Lord, you don't have that burden. Because <laughs> it's a big burden to have a lot of money. Pray. Literally, run. It says run. Flee. Flee from the love of money. Do everything in your being to submit your wealth to the Lordship of Christ. Pray that God would deliver you from the temptation to be proud and self-reliant, self-made. I am. Because you're not I am. I heard a heretical preacher on the internet the other day. And this heretical preacher was telling people out there that you and God are equal. You're equal to Jesus Christ. What a heresy. No, you're not. You're not. Name it and claim it. This word faith thing that goes on out there. It is a travesty how people have sunk into that. And they, and they, they, take, they try to amass the glory that belongs to Christ. You don't own your life. You are not God. You never will be. That's the lie in the garden. Don't swallow that lie. There's this health, wealth, prosperity gospel that's going out there. It's, it's a complete lie. Stay away from it. Run. Flee. It says right here, flee from the love of money. Don't say, oh, I'm a saint of God. I deserve the cattle on the thousand hills because they belong to God. No. Flee. Ah! Flee from the love of money. That's the scripture. We either trust man or we trust God. What do we what are we going to do? Trust God. Trust the Word of God. The Word of God is truth. Now, there have been people that have got this right. And, and I remember there was a lady, you guys probably don't remember this for the younger crowd anyway. And maybe the older crowd, maybe you weren't saved back in the 80s. Back in the late 80s, there was this very talented Christian artist, like singer. Very talented just had this kind of rumbling voice that was just tuned in. It was just, like, awesome. Most people have never heard of her. Her name was Margaret Becker. And I remember going to a concert of Margaret Becker's one time with my wife, and uh, it was fantastic. You know why? Unto thee, O Lord, be all glory and honor and power and dominion. This lady could have been... Joan Jett. She could have been famous and rich. And she didn't go that path. She went the path of glorifying Christ. And I'm not saying she's perfect. I'm just saying that there's certain songs sometimes that someone writes that are that impact you. She said this song. She had this she had this song called uh, it's called Dancing Down the Streets of Innocence. Dancing Down the Streets of Innocence. Just a couple of lyrics in closing here. I'd like to I'd like to read you a couple of these lyrics because I think she got it right. She said, Tonight I'll sleep like a baby on a bed of no regrets. Well, listen, you, you can have your money. Now you, you can keep your pride. I don't need nothing because I'll be ri living rich tonight in innocence. 
in innocence, in innocence. Why? Not because I'm good or she's good, but because Jesus is good. Tonight I will count my blessings. Contemplate the treasure of the meek, like the peace that passes understanding, the joy that keeps my soul while I'm planning on taking home the holy gold of innocence, innocence, innocence. My friends, pursue the life that is truly life. Let go of pride when it comes knocking, because it will. Your heart will lend itself to that in your flesh. But when you see it, flee. Say, Jesus, have mercy, oh God, you know how weak I am, how, how susceptible I am to being deceived and falling. Material speaking, this morning, you might not be rich. That's okay. Be content with the lot that God has given you. Don't, you can be a lover of money and be poor. Did you know that? It's not just rich people that are in love with money. Sometimes poor people are in love with money too. And they're trying everything they can think of, every gizmo and gadget, every scheme to try and make themselves rich. Well, God's like, flee from this. Rich people, if you've got it, make sure that you're in prayer and that you're using what God has given you as a good steward. Because there's a lot of great things that you can do in this life for the Lord. Make sure you're a good steward of that. Because when you go, every one of us is going to stand before the Lord. Pursue life. Leave the worthless things of this world behind. Trust in the Lord who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Take hold of the life that is truly life and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. If you commit your way unto the Lord and surrender all to Him, one thing you can be certain of is this. You will be living rich today and taking home the holy gold of innocence, all made possible by the precious blood of Jesus that was shed for your salvation and redemption. Amen. Would you pray with me? And musicians, would you come forward? Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We ask God that you would help us. Lord, we are weak and you are strong. God, every part of us needs you to be in charge. So Lord, we lay our hearts down before you today. We ask God that you would take everything we are and everything that we have into your hand, that you would do what you would have to do in and through us. God, I pray for those here today that you've, you're calling. Maybe there's some here today or someone that's listening to this message that doesn't know you. God, I pray that today would be the day that they surrender. And Lord, as those who, of us who are believers, sometimes our love for you waxes cold. We get caught up with the things of this world. Forgive us, Lord, for getting off track. Help us to return. Help us to have you as number one. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? God bless you, and may the grace and peace of the Lord rest on you this week as you go your way. I hope you all have a great afternoon, and uh, hope to see you again. God bless you.